thanks everyone <laughs> uh, for coming to the uh, PhD colloquium. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Shiming uh, Liu, who uh, did his undergraduate degree at Harvard University of Technology in uh, China before coming to uh, Penn in 2011. Yep. And, uh, Right. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share some of my research experience with uh, you guys. Um, so. Uh, Right, so my topic is a closed-loop bidirectional brain-machine interface system for freely behaving animals. Um, just want to like have an idea before I actually get started. Uh, can I see some hands? How many of you are like comfortable with integrated circuit design? Okay, good. And how many of you are comfortable with uh, brain? Nobody. Okay. So, well, actually, that's pretty common because this is not. I'm not neuroscience major, so I'm not also not very familiar with uh, neuroscience. Um, <clears throat> so let's just uh, get started. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the content that I want to cover today. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background introduction of what is a brain-computer interface system, with emphasis on why do we need a bidirectional closed-loop BMI system. And uh, I will talk about the system architecture. I will review some of the design requirements. And I'll give, uh, give some uh, examples of the uh, uh, integrated circuit implementation of the uh, BMI system from the uh, neural recording front end, to the uh, neural feature extraction processors, and the uh, electrical simulation uh, backends. And after that, I will talk about some of the uh, system integration and the uh, animal experience that we have been doing uh, using the uh, designed uh, BMI system. And in the end, I'll give, give the uh, conclusion. So. What is the brain-computer interface system? Basically, uh, it is just the artificial device that uh, uh, works as the uh, artificial communication pathway between our brain and the external world. The interface can be electrical, can be magnetic, can be optical, can be chemical. Basically, whatever it takes for us to figure out or understand what's going on inside of our head. So in this particular case, we're interested in the electrical brain-computer interface. So the question is, why do we want to study the brain? Well, uh, the most straightforward answer is that we really want to have a little better understanding of ourselves. And besides that, study the brain actually give us a opportunity to, to actually learn from the brain. For example, people want to design a very energy-efficient computer Nowadays, we have a CPU running at a gigahertz, but our brain is actually running at hundreds of hertz. Uh, but uh, in certain cases, it could be even more efficient. So can we design something, uh, can we design a digital computer working in a similar way as the, uh, the brain does? So kind of study the brain is like to open a door uh, for us to like completely change the engineering in the, in the current form. And besides that, the brain-computer interface devices actually provides a potential treatment for hundreds of millions of people who actually suffer from neural disease and neural disorders, including common diseases like Parkinson's, epilepsy, uh, and also a lot of people have this visual and hearing impairment, paralysis and amputations, things like that. For example, uh, there have already been the commercial devices like a deep brain stimulator for the patients who have uh, epilepsy. So the device has a little embedded system which can do some machine learning and detect a seizure happen. And then uh, uh, when there is a seizure happen or any neural disorder, weird energy happen, then they can deliver a large uh, stimulation current to suppress the, uh, the, the seizure happen. Or for the visual impairment, we already have the device that can do the stimulation directly in the visual cortex. So for the people who, have, who lost their sight, we can, by doing the electrical stimulation, we can restore the, the vision. 
So I would say the medical, directly medical application has always been the main driving force for the development of this kind of technology. Okay. So eventually, and I think this is even more important, is that the brain computer interface give us a uh, potentially a completely different ways that people, uh, how people can interact with the inter external world. Like imagine in the future if we have some like wireless chip that, that can be embedded in our brain, uh, we can do things without speaking or moving your hands. We can talking with each other without speaking. And imagine uh, you can have a computer embedded in your, in your brain, then you can do calculation even faster than the computer. Or if we can figure out how to encode the memory, then you can pretty much just download books in your brain so you don't have to memorize anything. Uh, but apparently, this kind of technology will kind of bring more troubles or problems than the benefit. But uh, at least in the current stage, it's not our concern. And since we're engineering, that we kind of leave this problem to the people who study social science and uh, philosophy. OK, so just a little background of the neuroscience. So how does it work? Um, so for the electrical uh, signal-based brain-computer interface, the basic idea is that the neural signal actually is electrical signal. So the neurons choose to present the information in terms of the electrical signal. So if you refresh your memory in the high school biology, then uh, we have a very good model for a single neuron. So we know how the body cell manipulate the ions inside of outside of the cell body and how they integrate the charges and how they fire the action potential and how the action potential the signal propagates along the axons and to the other neurons. So, but the really interesting part is not the, the neuron itself, the, because the neuron itself is kind of like encode information in a binary way. But the interesting part is that each of the individual neuron has this interconnection with up to 10,000 other neurons. So they form a massive neural network. And together we have about 100 billion neurons inside of our head. So it's like a massive neural network, and uh, it is actually beyond the current technology to completely model each single neuron. Uh, it's just uh, we don't have the, the proper tools, and we don't have the bandwidth to recover so much data. And for that case, people trying to uh, record the neural signal using different electrode and uh, instrumentation. So uh, the most of the com these are probably terminologies that you have heard about before. The most of the commonly used signal is called EEG. It's really uh, basically just the brain wave that you can record using the surface electrode, and the electrode is attached to the skin and the scalp uh, of your 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 head. Uh, intuitively, you won't be able to like record a single neuron's activity using EEG electrode, right? Because the, the, if you look at the dimension of the electrode, uh, you probably have a million neurons under that electrode. And also, the, the, uh, the, the, the scalp and the skin uh, works like a low-pass filter, right? So what you have in the EEG signal is that you have very low-frequency component. And uh, uh, basically, it's like in the, en uh, the energy of the population of the neuron in that area. Okay. And so if we want to have higher resolution or higher uh, bandwidth uh, information, then we have to go deep inside. That's why people develop these uh, invasive electrodes. So ECOG, for example, is the, basically the same, uh, same signal as the EEG. The only difference is now we place the electrode under the scale, uh, so we have larger signal and higher bandwidth. And, uh, if we keep going down, go deeper, then we can get access to what we call the action potential and local field potential. These are the like a single neuron or multiple neuron activities. So we can using electrode with uh, this kind of dimension, like a millimeter square, with hundreds of channels. So uh, with the very sharp electrode, you can actually get very close to a single neuron, so you can record activities activities of a of a single neuron. So if you look at the number of publications in the past 10 years, uh, you'll find that most of the research to today uh, are based on use, still based on using the non-invasive uh, EEG electrode. 
which is shown as the blue bars in the in this chart. And uh, in our lab, what we are doing is more like the invasive recording, which is uh, the the green part. And so we have the animal uh, to like work with. We have the neurosurgeons to implant the electrode inside deep inside the, the brain of the animals. Another interesting thing to note is that most of the research today, today have been focused on really the recording and decoding information from the brain. Uh, like this example, as the people who have amputation and we can have the device decode their, uh, we can have the electrode in their uh, motor cortex and decode uh, their intention and control the robotic arm, things like that. But it is actually equally important for us to actually give the feedback to the brain because the brain is actually a very complex, nonlinear, high dynamic system. So without a proper feedback, since you guys also do engineering design, without the proper feedback, it's very hard to characterize uh, the behavior. So uh, only using open loop approach, uh, it is very hard to have a device that is well under control. But if you look at the number of publications, only like one and two percent of the research state have been really focused on having the real feedback to the brain. And that's uh, my PhD research is uh, going to be focused on. So in our uh, design that we really uh, want to have the electronics design, which features the bidirectional interface, it can do both the neural signal recording and also the neural uh, signal uh, the electrical neural stimulation. The electrical neural stimulation actually push the charges inside of your brain. So it's kind of similar to the neuron does. When you, when you can manipulate those charges, you can actually trigger the action potential and you can encode the information in, in the brain. And we also have the electronics to interface with the external world, the real world. We can sense in the real world, we can do accurating. And with that two bidirectional interface, we can have a real like interface uh, with, with the brain. Yes, the visual is actually an important feedback. Actually, uh, yes. So that's why the the feedback, the uh, so the red curve, uh, the the red curve shows the bidirectional neural interface, and the, the yellow curve shows the, uh, the the closed loop system. So some of the closed loop is not using the electrical stimulation. It's not the direct closed loop to the brain, but you can use other ways. Okay, so. This is the block diagram of the system. So the real key part is, as I explained, is the BMI device. The BMI device do the neural signal recording and do the stimulation. It has the wireless interface to the computer. So on the computer, you have a user interface, and you can like configure the device. So you can do some modulation and algorithm, things like that. And we also have the sensor nodes where you can collect the information, the sensory data from the animals. So. I would say the really key difference between the custom BMI device and the commercial medical instrumentation is that uh, most of the medical instrumentation are designed for patients, right? So you assume that the people who actually use the, the instrumentation will cooperate. But with the animals, it's more challenging because you cannot simply tell the monkeys to sit down and do whatever you tell him to do. So. And many of the animal experience really requires the animals to be comfortable in their home cage and so you can observe their normal behavior. But with the conventional rack mount instrumentation, you won't be able to do that. So that's why we designed the custom electronics. So we can actually put, uh, put the devices on the animals and set them back to the, their home cage and do whatever they do. They move things and they... Uh, eat and they sleep. So that's the key difference and with the our custom electronic devices we can do some of the very interesting neural experiments that you won't be able to do before. Some of the some of the computation, the easy easy ones you can do that in the embedded system and some of them uh, we just aware to stream the data to the computer and do the algorithm on the computer. Depends on what kind of latency that you can tolerate. 
Right, so it kind of explain also in this figure because we can, like here, I've shown that so we can configure the system in different, different ways. Uh, for example, in this case, the subject has the BMI device and it's kind of closed loop inside of the BMI device. In other cases, that uh, we actually need to send the data to a computer with a more strong uh, working station that we can run more uh, analysis. So uh, the key part of my research is really uh, develop the, uh, the BMI device using the integrated circuit. So many of the neural recording front end and neural simulator back ends requires uh, custom circuit design. And if you want to incorporate more channels, then you definitely need to want to make the, the circuit very small and very compact. So the key building blocks in the BMI device include a neural recording front end a neural feature extraction accelerator, a machine learning processor, sometimes it's just a accelerator, and we have a uh, electrical simulator backend and some power management unit. So in the current stage, I haven't been able to like include everything in the system on chip, so we still have some supporting uh, electronics which is using the off-shelf components, including the uh, commercial CPU like a, a DSP or microcontroller and flash memory, which is not compatible with conventional CMOS technology, and also some of the wireless interface like a Bluetooth. So eventually the goal is to have the complete system on chip uh, and bonding to a very small die so we can have the, uh, the, the complete device, uh, make the complete device implantable. But in the current stage, uh, so we're limited by many things. We're limited by the uh, the, back, the back package uh, of our chip, and we're limited by some of the supporting electronics. Uh, so even though the system on chip itself is very small, but the overall system is still not uh, implantable. So we're, what we are doing now is that we have the electrode array implanted inside of the brain, and we leave the uh, the connectors on, on top of the animal. So we can plug in our device and uh, uh, also, like, we can replace the device and upgrade the system and uh, charge the batteries, things like that. So um, these are basically just a, a review of the design requirements. Uh, performance and functions are uh, the basic requirements. You want to make sure that you have a very good signal quality. Uh, you want to have all, the, all of these features to enable this uh, animal experience. And also in, important to guarantee the safety to make sure that it's about compatible, especially for the neural stimulator design, you want to make sure that it's safe. And also uh, make sure that you have that reliability, which is also important because uh, some of the wireless interface, uh, when the animal is moving around, you, you uh, occasionally you lose the data, you don't want that to happen. And also uh, you want to uh, uh, minimize the artifacts of the simulation. For example, you have a bidirectional interface and you do the simulation and you record the, sim uh, the, the artifacts of the, the simulator, which can be huge. So there are many efforts. These are really non-trivial matters, and, uh, which I will show you later. Okay. So I want to give a couple of examples of the integrated circuit implementation. Uh, so this one is for the neural front end. Uh, so basically, what is the challenge of a neural front end design? Uh, as we know that the neural signal itself can be very weak. It can be go down to 10 microvolt or even smaller than that. But we are fighting with all kind of noise in the environment. The main noise, for example, can be 100 volt. And what makes things even worse is that we have, remember that we have very sharp and very tiny electrode array, which makes the electrode has a very high input impedance. And uh, usually what happens is that this electrode has a very large impedance variance, which means uh, when you have a differential input amplifier, the two electrode has, for example, 15% mismatch. Then the common mode signal converts to a different signal at the input of your amplifier, which means no matter how, how much common mode rejection ratio you have in your amplifier, it's not going to help because your common mode signal is already a different signal at the input stage. So in this case, what you can do is you can have 
an extremely high input impedance amplifier. And how do you do that? Basically, you can have this feedback design. So basically, what is a load impedance? It's just a, the source is, dri is trying to drive the load, right? So it takes the current to drive the load. And if you have the current feedback, have the exactly amount of value in the current feedback, so your source uh, looks like it's not driving anything. So the car feedback current kind of compensates the current used to drive the load. So essentially that you can have a several gigahertz or even uh, several gigaohm or even higher uh, input impedance. So that, that's one example of the neural amplifier design. And at the same time, you want to maxim maximize the energy efficiency. I don't want to go to too much of the details, but like some of the technology like uh, design the ampli uh, amplifiers and bias the transistors in the subsource or region, combine the GM to maximize the uh, energy efficiency. And then we have all of these filters uh, uh, and the ADC design. This is a block diagram of one channel, and we can have uh, multiple channels. So one uh, interesting feature, and I proposed in my uh, system, is that this pre-whitening amplifier. So an uh, interesting feature of the neural signal is that it really has this 1 over f uh, to the 2 or 4 power energy feature which means that in the very low frequency, your signal amplitude is huge. And in the higher frequency, it becomes smaller. So if you have an amplifier with a, like a constant gain over that frequency range, you kind of lost a lot of uh, dynamic range uh, in, in the high frequency because you don't really need to use that. So one thing that we can do is that we can shape the frequency. So we can have lower uh, dynamic range in the, in the lower frequency so we can kind of combine the, uh, compound the signal so we can uh, lower the dynamic range requirements in the amplifier design. Now, one challenge is that, as some of you are familiar with that, so the CMOS circuit has this strong flicker noise in the lower frequency, which means that you kind of, you kind of end up with having higher noise while you lower the signal amplitude, so you, you sacrifice your SNR. So what we can do in this particular case is that we can do a modulation to first modulate the signal to a higher frequency when we don't have that flicker noise and then amplify the signal in a relatively clean area and then modulate the signal back so we can have uh, that design. So uh, basically, this is some uh, measurement result. The first line shows the original data. The second line shows the pre-whitening data. Uh, where you can see that we can like squeeze the signal and then we can recover them. And if we perform the uh, uh, calculate the PSNR or uh, calculate the co correlation coefficient, it's more than sufficient for the neural uh, features, uh, neural signal study. Uh, yes. It is supposed to be the same. Oh, you've added another amplifier. Uh, so it's like a, this is what we can do after we collect the pre whitened data. Yeah. Yes. By the way, is it possible for the CRP or the CCM to be the same for all three types of signals you mentioned at the beginning, the EG, the E code, and the local uh, signal? Or uh, so most of for the local field potential because for EEG we only look at a uh, very low frequency part. Yeah. So another thing that uh, I explored uh, in the neural front end design is this compressed sampling. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with compressed sensing. Basically the idea is that uh, the compressed sensing theory allows you to do the sampling with a lower sampling rate than the nitrous sampling rate. So, uh, so this is a collaboration work with some of the investigators from Johns Hopkins. So the basic idea of the neural front end design is that uh, what we want to do is to collect the information. And what is information in electrical signal? Basically, the dynamic range and the bandwidth. It's kind of information is kind of the product of the dynamic range and the bandwidth. So dynamic, dynamic range tells you how much information that you can present at a single time point. And bandwidth tells you how fast that can change with time. 
for example, if you have a DC signal which is not changing with time, so you hardly have any new information. So if we want to have a very energy efficient neural front end design, what we can do is to try to lower the dynamic range of the signal and at the same time try to lower the bandwidth by using compressed sensing. So this kind of, uh, these two approaches combined together give us the, uh, the most energy efficient design for the, for the neural front end. Yes. There is a huge yes. Uh, computational load yes. that you have to. Are you um, offloading that for the, to the computer in order to save energy? Is that the idea? Yes. Yes. Okay. So basically, all the reconstruction is done if you do L1 optimization that is done on the computer. Oh. But another point is that some of the neural feature extraction can be in the compressed domain. So you don't have to recover the data. Yeah. So this is one example of the uh, device implementation of the compressed sampling front end. We also, in this case, we also have the uh, inductive charging. Uh, with the uh, inductive coil, we can trans transmit the power to our device at the same time scatter, read back the data. Okay, so I want to also talk about two examples of the uh, implementation of the Right, so in this case, it's like uh, five millimeter. Yeah, we designed that to transfer across the skin. That's pretty much. Right. In fact, uh, you can definitely go further, but uh, at the price of higher energy loss. But the problem is that it will ge also generate heat. So I want to give two examples of the uh, neural feature extraction that we did. Uh, so Usually when you look at the neural data, you don't want to really look at the raw data. Sometimes you do the feature extraction first, especially when we have machine learning that you do the feature extraction and then put, use that as the input of whatever machine learning core you have. So um, one popular or commonly used neural feature is the energy feature, right? So, uh, and there is an uh, interesting thing with the neural energy is that it has very high frequency resolution in the lower frequency range and has this uh, coarse uh, frequency resolution in the high frequency range. Which is, uh, so if we do the conventional filter or FFD filter, you kind of has the uniform frequency bin, right? So you, you kind of lost the resolution in the very f low frequency range. So what I did in this case is that I designed the analog integrated circuit to have the similar uh, like similar performance. So in the low frequency, uh, I bias the transistor so it has uh, higher, uh, bias the filter of the transistor so it has higher frequency resolution. This is the, the PSD, the power spectrum. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. So this is the circuit implementation of the neural feature extraction uh, processor that we have. So because the transistor also has this uh, log domain, natural log domain uh, current behavior in the subsurface region. So if you do uh, the biasing using that, using that feature, so you kind of match what you have in the neural signal. So it's like a more efficient way to bias the, the filter. So I don't want to go to too much of the details, uh, but I would say one of the challenge of that design is first that you have a larger variation of the biasing the transistor in the subsurface sub region, and also uh, you have a larger variation because the GMC filter is very hard. Uh, the GM is a little bit difficult to control. But the good thing is that we can make that programmable and we can do the uh, calibration. Uh, but eventually, we end up with having a more energy efficient implementation. Imagine that if, so the overall design is like a sub microwave. Uh, so if you have a lot of channel, then we can do that processing in parallel. 
Otherwise, if you do that uh, FFT, for example, for each individual channel, and if you have hundreds of channel, and you want to do it, that in a single CPU, that's going to burn a lot of power. Okay. So another feature extraction is the match the filter. Uh, so in the, for the neural signal, a lot in a lot of cases that uh, the energy itself won't tell you the whole story because it also has the phase information. It's really the frequency and the phase coupled together give you the feature. So uh, so in this design, I have the match the filter, which you first design a template and then use the template you can like uh, extract whatever that the neural uh, phase and amplitude coupled feature uh, together. And uh, so it can be shown that with my uh, the previous uh, pre-whitening filter and combined with the match the filter, you can have stronger uh, correlation. Okay. So this is for the uh, neural stimulator design. <clears throat> So the basic idea of the neural stimulator, as I mentioned, is to really push the charges inside of the brain to trigger the action potential signal. But the problem is that when you actually inject the current to the brain, the charge of the electrons will also cause the, uh, the chemical reaction, right? So it will generate some products. And sometimes the products will just uh, diffuse away, and uh, you won't be able to recover that. And you don't want that to happen because some of the products can be a toxic to the brain tissue. And usually the case is that uh, most of the commercial uh, stimulator, after you implant the electrode in, for example, for say a year, uh, the tissue around that electrode will start to like, get infection or try to repel the electrode. So from the electronics design point of view, it is very important to guarantee that you have a net zero charge design. Basically, you don't want to leave the charges inside of the brain. So after we inject the charges in the brain and trigger the action potential, you want to pull those charges back. So when we go to the details of the circuit design, most of the people propose to have a very accurate current source, and you want to uh, very well uh, match the current sources uh, so that you can have a net zero charge design. But in fact, that is not true in the real case because as we know that some of the products cannot, some of the chemical reaction is not reversive. Some of the products already diffuse away. So <clears throat> without knowing that information that you won't be able to have the complete uh, net zero charge. So what I'm proposing in this case is to have the feedback system and actually measure whatever residual charges that is inside of the body and use that information to determine how, mu how much uh, reversal time that is going to be required. <clears throat> so these are some of the uh, uh, block diagrams for that certain implementation. So <clears throat> another thing is that uh, in order to have the high energy efficiency, you want to make the supply voltage to be adaptive. Uh, so for most of the uh, electrical stimulation, usually it requires a pretty high complex voltage. And depends on the surface, surface area of the uh, electrode, sometimes the, the, the stimulation current can be very large, can be go to several uh, milliamp, and which is very huge uh, power consumption. <clears throat> so uh, if, uh, for example, if we constantly, uh, if we use a constant supply voltage, then uh, since the power consumption is really the supply voltage times the current you use, uh, you actually need to pay a lot of power. But in some cases, uh, you don't really need to use that whole compliance voltage range, which means that in many cases, uh, you can uh, try to adapt your supply voltage to compensate and to provide uh, whatever compliance voltage that is required. And in that case, you can save the power consumption. And these are uh, the block diagram and the circuit implementation for that uh, design. And uh, uh, okay, so I don't want to talk to the details. So after we got the neural recording front end, the neural simulator, and the neural feature extraction processor, then we can actually integrate all of these things in, on a single chip and design uh, 
uh, the uh, the closed loop algorithm, it can be implemented on chip. It can be implemented in the uh, embedded system. So these are some of the uh, animal experiments that we have been doing using the developed the custom uh, electronics. Uh, this one, for example, is the uh, uh, is designed for the monkey. <clears throat> so we have this chamber that can be fixed on the on the, on the skulls. Uh, on the skull of the monkey, and we have the uh, electronics housing inside of the inside of the chamber. Um, so basically, this is a 32-channel device, and as you can see, that the limiting like factor is that uh, still need to have a very large battery. So these are some of the uh, data. Again, this is the the power spectrum over like 30 hours. Uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, so during the day, usually that has higher like frequency activities than when the animal is sleeping, that has more lower frequency activities. And uh, so this particular project is for memory enhancement, uh, memory enhancement. So we do the simulation for very long term, and we can tr we can show that we can trigger such uh, reason in the hippocampus, which we believe that will like helps to enhance the memory for the for the animals. And this is the research that is still ongoing. So as I mentioned before, that one of the important feedback uh, to the brain is actually the somatosensory feedback. So uh, this is the one uh, patient that we had a couple of years ago. And that patient uh, actually uh, uh, has this lesion in, in his uh, uh, somatosensory cortex, and he uh, lost uh, his feeling of his hands and arm. But uh, he still have a, uh, he still had the, uh, this uh, intact uh, motor cortex, so he can still uh, use his arm and the muscles. Uh, the only problem is that he cannot feel his hand. So I designed this small sensor uh, box with this pressure sensor and accelerometer. And for example, if you and I, we, we, we hold this box, uh, and we like shake the box, you will find out your finger will automatically adju adjust the, the force to compensate that acceleration. Uh, that is because we have the feedback, we have the feeling, and we know how much force to use in our finger. But with these pa uh, this patient, because he don't have that feedback anymore, so he, he, uh, he, he won't be able to know how much force to use. So usually it just ends up with either he used too much force or he just uh, dropped the box. So we want to help patients like, like, like him. So what we can do is we want to have that microelectrode array implanted in the brainstem, and we want to do the microelectrical stimulation, try to restore the feeling of his fingers. And we actually did a study in a, in a monkey. So we, try to, we want to try to f uh, figure out the map between your hand and the uh, brain stem. So it's kind of like a mapping process. So as you can see in this video, the sound you hear is the action potential data. So when you touch the monkeys in different body area, you can hear the, the neurons fire in different area of the brain stem. Yes, it kind of affects the, uh, uh, the peripheral nerve and also some part of the like, higher level of the brain. So we're kind of doing the lower level stimulation. So after we figure out that map, so it's, uh, these, two are, these two figures out indicate the two arrays that we implanted in the, in the brain stem. And, uh, the different colors means different body area. So after we find out uh, the mapping, then what we can do is we can actually do in the electrical stimulation in that, uh, in that uh, electrode. Then with the monkeys, uh, the experiment is that we want to show that uh, uh, sometimes uh, so when we give the physical Stimulants were a uh, physical touch on the monkey, and sometimes we give the electrical stimulation, uh, and we want to show that the monkey won't be able to tell the difference. So that means that they, they, uh, it, 
So for the monkey, it, it feels the same. Okay. Oh, so that means the electrode array. So you have an electrode array. So that, that means, uh, so you have a turn back turn. Mm -hmm. That the neuron in that area will react. It will be different because uh, it is very hard to place the uh, array in the exact the same spot. So you kind of need to do that mapping for each individual subject. Okay. So another experiment that I want to share with you is this water maze. And we, we do that experiment with a rat, apparently. So we have this waterproofed, custom-designed uh, electrical simulator, and, uh, which is wireless. And we put that in a small uh, backpack, and we put that in the, in the rat. And we have this water tank, and we have a hidden platform. So the rat uh, can swim but naturally, but uh, the rat don't know. Uh, the rat wants to get out of the water, but uh, he he can't, can't see the, the platform. So uh, first we train the rat so he knows there is a platform, and when he gets to the platform, we'll give, some, uh, give him some reward. Okay? And then we have the video camera to track the location of the rat. So, and after the training, then we can use the electrical stimulation to try to guide the rat to swim towards the, the platform. Okay. So, okay, so this is kind of like the block diagram of the, the whole system. And we put a lot of effort to uh, trying to like, make sure that it will be a safe stimulation. For example, the water sometimes can be, uh, can short the electrode, and we want to make sure that there won't be like these things happen. Uh, so a lot of monitoring circuit, uh, like send back the compliance voltage and to uh, guarantee that, that uh, it will be safe in, in case of emergency that you want to like uh, turn off the device. And uh, for the, uh, on the computer part, we have a user interface so the people from medical school who are not familiar with electronics design will be able to use the system. Um, so this project kind of run for uh, two years. Uh, we, so I want to show some of the videos in the, this is actually from very early stage. Uh, so in this video, this is without the simulation, so the rat is trying to like swim around, trying to figure out where the platform is. Uh, it takes a while, and then we just uh, rescue him. And then after, after the training, then we can show that we can use, we can actually use the simulation to, to guide the, the rat to swim to the platform. So this is another example of the closed loop sensory in, in encoding in the animal. Uh, right, so these are some of the, uh, the chips that I take out during my PhD research. Uh, okay, so I want to give some conclusion uh, for my talk. Uh, in this work, I present a bidirectional closed loop brain machine interface system for freely behaving animals. So in the circuit level, I propose some novel circuit in the neural front end, pre whitening and compressed sensing, uh, nasal charge neural stimulator, and some novel neural feature extraction processor, all of these in the custom IC design. So in the system level, I have this bidirectional neural interface. I have some uh, custom design closed loop al algorithm, have the system integrated, uh, and also package. And in the application level, we have some novel uh, experiences actually using the, the custom design uh, and uh, uh, the electronics support the uh, experiences in the animals to have this free behavior. So the real challenge or bottleneck of the uh, neuroscience research is usually we don't have the complete, accurate information from the brain. Uh, from the brain. So it, so what we are trying to do in our lab is to uh, kind of uh, provide the, the proper tool uh, to study the brain using the uh, electronics and uh, custom design to enable some of the experiments that were not, people were not able to do before. So with all of these uh, novel uh, electronics design and packaging and signal processing and machine learning that we uh, uh, we think that will be a breakthrough in the research of the 
bring computer interface in the next uh, few years, and we're looking for that. And that concludes my talk, and thank you all for your attention. So I'm happy to take any questions, if there is any. How it's supposed to work? Uh, right. So, so we're trying to show that uh, after triggering that rhythm in the hippocampus, that will help you enhance the memory. A similar example is that some people want to show that when you listen to music, kind of help you memorize things. Okay. It's similar to that, but. The real neuroscience, I think, is still under investigation. What do you think the biggest challenge is for the future uh, in order to minimize and have all the systems writing from the, in the, uh, the, animal, in the animal's head or the future in the human's head? What mm -hmm. do you think you know, in, the, in the future time will be the biggest challenge? So there are challenges coming from many ways. and. Uh, so um, for the medical application, I would say the power consumption is one, one of them. The neural interface is one of them. Uh, so the electrode biocompatible issue is uh, very important. And for the electronics and the power is one thing, because uh, you won't be able to like, do a surgery to like, change the battery. So if your battery dies, kind of, uh, the whole thing is kind of the trouble. In general, the, uh, the money is the, the, the problem. <laughs> if you have enough money, then all of this is not a problem.